Yeah, it's kind of hard to follow the field master's review of Insecure. And <laughs> he gives you a pretty good overview. And uh, I'll, I'll touch on the overview really quickly because, you know, my main thing is the the character sketches, right? Because I think the most interesting thing about Insecure is really not the plot. Because the script that you that they surround the characters in is just a device so that you can get to know how these people or their personalities kind of come out depending on what the circumstances are because it's really about the personalities what i wanted didn't happen because we wanted to get some kind of resolution about what happened at the end of the the fourth season which you know took two years to make uh especially with uh, with lawrence and condola and it's kind of we would have it would have been nice to kind of see it in the first episode, but I think they, instead of jumping right in, which normally they would have, they're kind of taking it slow. Insecure is very good at veering off the path and and doing something else, right? They they don't they never take the straight route <laughs> to whatever, right? Which I guess that is the difference between men and women, right? Men want to go directly to the point, see how things work, and then see how that their thought or their idea actually affects the rest of the world. So they think from the inside out or want to see things from the inside out. Women actually want to peel back the layers. They don't want to know the answer. They want to enjoy the effects and the surroundings and then get surprised when they actually come to the truth, which takes a lot longer. They like peeling back the layers of the onion. Men just want to cut the onion in half and see what's inside. Different approach, I suppose. So. Since this is a woman's show, we're taking the long way around. So when we open up, we basically see them head into their alma mater, which is Stanford, because they're, they're having a reunion and Issa's doing a panel. But the interesting thing about them going to Stanford where they met is we get to see how this group was formed, how this friendship was actually formed and who these people are in the environment that formed them. No, so we get to see the seed as opposed to the tree, which I thought we should have kind of had at least some flashbacks to kind of see how these people actually met and came together. That would have been nice to do, like even in season two, an episode about why these people are friends. Because a lot of Insecure is actually shrouded in mystery. You really don't know a whole lot about the backstory of these particular characters. You know, you have glimpses and I think they put in just enough backstory to fill in a hole that they can't fill in. But going back, you can see how this uh, uh, Faye group, which is female hierarchy group, shout out to Cousin Tito, how this Faye group was actually formed. And when you see them on campus and you see their backstory, then all of a sudden who they are really may, starts to make sense. It really does. You learn uh, why these women are in certain positions and why they're old certain position in their circle and then why these friendships are actually formed why does kelly follow tiffany around and her her ride or die and her protector why is isa so connected to molly and vice versa when you look at them on the campus of stanford and hear their backstories you kind of understand why things are and this would have made a whole lot of sense like four years ago okay with at least the second season why these people are actually connected it made a whole lot of sense but instead of rattling on, we're going to get right to it. And, you know, I would really love to jump in and talk about Molly and Issa, but those are the main two characters. But I think I'm going to start off with the side characters because we're going to start off with, with Tiffany and why Tiffany is the queen bee of the Fay group. Why, for the most part, the core of women actually follow her lead. And when we see her on campus, especially in her colors, and there's been a controversy about her wearing the AKA colors. But she is a quintessential, what I call AKA type, Alpha Kappa Alpha type woman, which in a lot of black campuses is actually the ideal woman. Most guys that have gone to a college where there's been black fraternities on campus, this ideal or ideal woman is the most sought after on campus. This is the one that the masters of the universe coming out of college want. This is the ones, you know, even back when the 
the fraternities were actually formed back in Howard and other places like in, you know, in the early uh, 20th century. Okay, they used to have a paper bag and a fine tooth comb because if you were, weren't lighter than the paper bag and run your hair through this fine tooth comb, then you couldn't go inside. You couldn't be part of the fraternity. And that legacy is still with us, especially for masters of the universe. So when I when you say colorism exists, for most of the black society, it's really not that big a deal. But when you come to the upper classes, the upper classes of black people, the masters of the universe up, there's a certain look that they want. And Tiffany, played by Amanda Seals, is that quintessential AKA look. I was even talking to Ram a few days ago about the AKA type. When I say the AKA type, this is what I'm talking about. Tiffany is the ideal AKA type. So naturally, since she's the ideal, she becomes the queen bee. You notice that she's the only one of the group that's married. And we find out that she's been with her masters of the universe, which is Derek, since freshman year, which is backwards for most black women. Most black women go to college so they don't need a man. Tiffany obviously went to Stanford to find a man and she got a, her husband even before she got out of college. She found her husband in freshman year. The other ones, there it's been 10 years, really 14 years, hence, and they're still not married. So her form has followed its function. She's done it, every, everything down the line. She's basically had the, the nice, the good husband, the good life, the upscale standards, her snootiness, all that stuff makes sense. Even she's actually the queen bee of another group, which she calls the crazy crew. All of this makes sense when you see her on campus wearing this outfit. That explains why our next personality, which is Kelly, why Kelly's so attached to her. Now, in this episode, we find out that Kelly is dead, right? Or th they think that Kelly is dead, even though we can see she's perfectly alive and breathing. But on campus, Kelly was basically invisible, except to her inner circle. She was invisible. And we find out that she was so invisible, uh, the only thing that people really knew about Kelly is that she was allergic to kale. All her interactions with, with band members and, and frat members, Kelly has been invisible her whole life. And her experience being invisible on campus actually kind of set her path, for lack of a better term. She's a 92, probably high 92. She's in Stanford, at Stanford. She's probably high 92. She's a six-figure girl. They never tell how much money Kelly actually makes, but Kelly has to at least be a six-figure girl, much like Molly and pro much like uh, Tiffany, they just never say it. But since she's invisible to the men in her class, that's why Kelly settles sexually, not, not marriage-wise, but sexually, what we call lesser men or lower class men. So now that we know who Kelly is and what she's gone through, her in a formative experience, college is a formative experience. We know why she messes or cats around with what she deems lower class men Why she dates guys that are 87s and 85s because she's invisible to the guys in, in the upper classes like, like Lawrence and Derek and a few others, which is why Issa's brother can't stand her, which is why she has to be obnoxious because she wants to be seen, which is why she attaches herself to the queen bee because next to the queen bee, she can be acknowledged and she can be seen. Without the Queen Bee, nobody would know who she was. She'd be invisible like she was when she was in college. So that's like um, Kelly is in service to Tiffany, to her AKA goddess. So now we know the relationship between Kelly and Tiffany. And I'm assuming Issa is, I don't know if Issa's part of the sorority or not because she's never interacted with it, but we know Molly in this scene is actually part of the sorority. Now, the two pieces of information about Molly that is interesting, right, coming from here, because Molly, we know, is a hood rat, a self-avowed hood rat from South Central. And we've seen her family, and she's nothing like her family, right? Not, nothing like her brothers. 
she's actually a climber. Well, to go from, trust and believe, going from South Central to Stanford and you're not an athlete, that's a pretty tough task. And for Molly to get there, that shows the kind of drive that she has. And one example of her, not only her drive, but her determination and her personality uh, is explained here with Issa and her first met. Remember our first trip off campus? <laughs> yeah. And them dumbass, stupid ass, white ass parents asked if we were athletes. That you cussed them the fuck out? Show sure did. That's what I do. I was like, I want to be friends with this girl. She cusses so eloquently. Uh, yeah, that was before I learned the white whisper. <laughs> all that confidence, boy. Freshman year, we thought we had it all figured out. <laughs> we thought. And they were getting on the bus uh, from Stanford and the white people Evidently, you know, according to Issa, thought they were athletes and Molly cussed them out. And that impressed Issa so much as an 18-year-old that Issa became her friend. So after that, Molly made an impression on Issa, which is also why Issa in this fake group actually follows Molly. Molly, that's why Molly is second in command. But what we find out is that Molly's also in the AK fraternity which will come up in a second. Molly's in the fraternity, which is why Molly also bows down to the queen or the ideal AKA image, which is Tiffany. Even though Molly's got her own strength, Molly's got her upfront attitude. You have really never seen Molly go at Tiffany. You've seen her go at, at Kelly, you've seen her go at Issa, but never really Tiffany. Why? Because Tiffany's the queen in this fake group. Tiffany's the ideal. Tiffany is what Molly wants to be. The clothes, the shoes, the hair, all that stuff, all her style is actually really trying to be that light skin, 3C hair, AKA type that, that has a Masters of the Universe husband. The second piece that we're gonna go through with Molly, which is quite interesting, is what I think is Molly's imprint. Now we saw this, I think I did a video on this a ways back with, uh, there was a girl that was on there, I can't remember her name. She was actually part of another group on YouTube. And she talked about how she dated basically the same guy in her 20s. And when she was a freshman, she got imprinted on a guy that was in the frat. And she basically chased a similar type of guy for the, uh, for the rest of her life until she got to be 30. Now, we always wonder where Molly gets her taste from, right? Or, you know, especially her snooty taste from. And we know it it, it cannot have come from uh, her neighborhood or surroundings because those are different kind of guys. And so we're always wondering where her imprint came from because it really wasn't high school. It had to be college or later on, right? And this is where we find her imprint. That time. And then they got busted. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, man, we got clowned for that. But she left the pajama parties to the Omega. Uh uh, the Omega pajama parties always felt like ass. Them dudes stuck. It was like walking dead into a booty hole. Right? <laughs> ass crack, smelling ass, ass. <laughs> Strolling all hard, stinky. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody want that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, well, this was fun. Omari's divorced now. Bye, guys. <laughs> <laughs> what? What the fuck was that? They've been planning to leave us alone for a minute. I guess they don't want you to let me get away again. I'm sorry, let, let you get away again? Mm -hmm. What I remember is that we were friends with benefits and I was the only one providing the benefits. Uh, come on, I like to think I provided some benefits too. You know what you did? Your twin mattress and dates in the dining hall. <laughs> I was broke back then. <laughs> and there's a lot of stuff we still don't know about each other. Oh, really? Yeah. Like what? I got a key mattress now. <laughs> this is the guy. This is the guy. This you, you can see the interaction that she has with him. And her talking about how she gave more than he gave to her and how they had a friends with benefits arrangement. You can see in her eyes and see the way he's talking that he had her by her short hairs. Because when they, they're sitting there talking about the frat game and they're talking about the, the frat experiences and then they, and then men kind of break off and walk away and say how uh, he's divorced. And he says that they're trying to make sure that we're alone. And she says, why? Because they want to make sure that you don't that let me get away this time. So evidently there was, there was a split and he's the one that got away. So the same way the other 
young lady said that her college frat guy is the one that got away. So, so this guy is her imprint. This guy made a profound influence on her life. He imprinted her. You see in her eyes, her eyes get big and she's kind of discombobulated. Even though she's going through a breakup with Andrew, this is where her standards come from. She wants to be her version of, of Derek and Tiffany. And now she's taking the rest of the of this particular episode, wondering wh where it went wrong and why she should get back with him. So this moment kind of, uh, this experience with this guy kind of informed the rest of her life, not only her kind of job, uh, her professional life, but also her love life. You say when she was with a, type, a guy like him, or a, a, a frat guy like this, uh, like Dro, she was willing to be a second wife. And she tried to replace this particular guy with a guy like Andrew and others, but things she couldn't. This is the guy. This is who she's forged in. This is where she gets her taste from. It's where she gets her snootiness from. This is why all guys in her mind are lesser. They're not him. Also why she gets all moon-eyed moon when she actually talks to Lawrence. But it's also why she, this is the one guy that she can't put that tough hood rat exterior up against because he's got her. And he knows he does. In fact, their first, their, his first interaction, he knows that he has her. But that's Molly. That's Molly's experience. Things just snap into place once you see these characters in their native setting, uh, in their origin story. It's almost like seeing an origin story in a comic book, and how these people became to be who they are. And last but not least is our, our star, Issa. Now, we've already seen why Issa and Molly are together and why Issa is in service to Molly. Issa has, has always wanted to be what Molly is. In a sense, just she doesn't want to work as hard as Molly does. While her being her same old awkward stuff when she's actually on uh, the panel because she's been asked to speak, her interaction in the mirror is really telling about who she is, why she is, what she expected, and why she went off the rails. Issa? Is that me? Oh, shit! Throwback me! I forgot how cute I look with twists. No, but this new look is working for us, too. Do you like this? And we got our braces off? Let me see them teeth. Let me see them teeth. <laughs> Let me see them teeth. Ah. Show me how you eat. Ah. <laughs> we stupid. So what are you... Oh, no, you good. But... <laughs> so what are you doing here? <laughs> no, uh, it's our 10-year reunion, and Stanford asked me to speak on a panel. I know we'd be a big deal. Yes. Okay, so what else? Do we meet T-Pain yet? <gasps> Nappy boy, ooh wee, them locks. Mm. No, girl, but we still got time, and he is still fun. Okay. Well, do we have any men? Girl, it's complicated. Oh, uh, like the Facebook status? Okay, well, I know you're a big time lawyer now. Did you and Molly start a firm together? No, I never really wanted to be a lawyer. You know this. Well, as long as you and Molly still gully for shizzle. Yeah, we're in a good place. We're being good to each other. Hmm. No, I, I actually started uh, my own company. I'll see you, CEO. Right? It's called The Block. Black Life Opportunity. Com Fuck. Maybe I should write it on my hand. I'll get it. OK, well, let me see what them abs talking about. I see you, crop top. Oh, sorry. What'd you think? Oh man, where did I go wrong? Shut up, look at you. Jamel's cheating on you. He is? He's up. We going to eat, you hungry? Uh, yeah, I'll be there in a minute. Hey, hmm? photos on the app? Invent that shit, call it Instagram. Okay, yeah. What's the app? Like I said, you can see her talking to her younger self, right? And seeing what she expected and what happened. Like the most telling thing is that, uh, did you and Molly get a law firm together? Do you guys start one? Well, Molly didn't start one and Issa didn't become a lawyer. And she says, I never really wanted to become a lawyer. And she tells her, her former self, you know that. But she did start her own business. And one, <laughs> one thing that was funny when, when Issa was actually showing off her abs and uh, there's a line that she, that she used. I, and I think it's not just about the way Issa's older self looks, but everything else. When she's like, when she says, where did I go wrong? 
And I think that's telling not only about the way she looks, but also the rest of her life. You did, she did, Issa never followed through on her potential, a follow through on her plans, which is a typical 89. Issa's an 89 bohemian, okay? She, she goes with the flow. She wants to be non-conventional. One, because she doesn't want structure. That's why she drives for Lyft. That's why she manages apartments. That's why she started her own business, not in something formal, but something informal, uh, like a block party group, which is non-structured and non-practical. That's a bohemian lifestyle. Talented, she's knowledgeable, she's educated, but she's an 89. She doesn't want the corporate structured lifestyle and the work it would take to be a 92. That's telling. And the last part we're gonna look at, because I don't want this to be too long, is when you look at all this, and then you look at Issa being unconventional, she's the unconventional one in the group. Even though she's part of it, you know, the way she's connected to the group is not Tiffany. Most of the group looks up to Tiffany. Okay, they're in service to Tiffany. Issa's the only one that's not in service to Tiffany. She's only in service to, in, to Tiffany through Molly. Molly wants to be Tiffany. Issa does not want to be Tiffany. Issa's the only one in the group that will still stand up to Tiffany. One, because they're probably raised basically in the same class, whereas Kelly and and Molly weren't. But Issa and Tiffany went in two divergent paths. The reason that Issa didn't get imprinted by one of those guys on campus because she got imprinted by a guy from high school, by a lower class guy, which is why her interaction with Lawrence is so tough. Daniel's her imprint from high school that 85 slash 87 for Hallick Street dude versus the educated dude from Georgetown. What she's imprinted by versus what she should be with. If she wants to be with the group, she should be with Lawrence. I have no doubt that she loves Lawrence, but Lawrence doesn't fit because East is not really a 92 or doesn't really want to be that, that 92, that corporate person, that business person. And Lawrence, whether you like him or not, is not Daniel. Is not going to be Daniel. And the problem with Issa is Daniel's lifestyle, what Daniel does, is not congruent with who who Issa needs to be. Issa, Issa is still, whether you like it or not, part of that Faye group, even though she's not a 92, which is the crux with Issa. Even the younger Issa in the mirror saying the same thing. Where'd I go wrong? I shouldn't be with a, a, Dan, uh, with a Daniel. I should be with a Lawrence according to the script, but I'm not following the script, which is why the interaction with Lawrence is so significant at the end. Now, why she has Lawrence picking her up from the airport, I do not know, because evidently it's completely over. And why meet up and put each other in the space, which I know it's the script writers, doesn't make sense just so that she can turn him down. Maybe it is so, she, so that she can turn him down and it could be over because now she says, I got to think about the future. I think she says that before, it says that to Molly, it's, it's time to go forward. And it's time to go forward away from what, you, what you've what you done in the past and be that this new person that you're getting ready to start. And Lawrence does not fit. And in my estimation, Lawrence shouldn't fit because Lawrence is a, becomes an 89. He gets pulled into Issa's gravity. He becomes an 89. He becomes unambitious because he has unambitious leanings. And with Issa, it becomes easy to be that unambitious person. Because you ever notice when Lawrence is away from Issa, he does a, a lot better. He's on his grind, on his purpose. But when he's with her, he, he starts to slack. She's the wrong type of woman for him. But I've said that many, many, many times. But he's also afraid of a woman like Condola because Condola is a 92. Condola has drive. Condola is trying to pull him up. Issa's trying to pull him back. Condola's trying to pull him up. And part of him doesn't want that kind of pressure. Part of him doesn't, even though he needs it. But seeing the girls in their origin story, for lack of a better term, give us a peek into these characters and why they are who they are and how they connect to each other. I would love to know why, you know, after five years, how Issa and Lawrence met and why they connect. Because to me, it doesn't make sense. Even though on paper with the check boxes, they belong together. Stanford, Georgetown, uh, upper middle class raised, upper middle class raised on, on, 
on the check boxes they actually match but in person the way they interact they don't and at some point we we would love to get to the bottom of who these people are and why they why they actually do what they do because that's the whole point of it so why go five years and not get to the bottom of it maybe this season we will maybe the, the script writers they've given us the gym to actually wrap everything up and answer all the questions and this episode, whether it's even though it's a lackluster episode, they could have done out with done without the panel has done a little bit of that. But like I said, I don't want this get to get to be too long. So I'm going to end it here. This is BGS out. And I'll